Hello and welcome back and before we start today's video come join me by the fire a moment and let me tell you a story the year was 2008-2009 Rob from the past was there trying to kick out his old PC his old alien PC clonking around in the corner with a new hard drive and he didn't have a lot of money on the but he's looking around online and luck beyond luck he sees this this Seagate Barracuda 160 gig PATA or IDE R drive knocking around online for about 250 to 260 nicker. I was absolutely elated. Now, obviously, I haven't got the economic index in front of me, but I think back at about 2008, 2009, 250 nicker was about a billion quid in today's money. And right now, the energy and excitement I had for that drive more than a decade and a half ago. I'm now talking about this, and my it's like my eyes are going to melt. This thing, the Acer Store Flash Door 12 Pro. This is a 12-bay NVMe NAS with 10 GBE knocking around for 850 nicker, give or take there. There is a 6-bay model that doesn't have 10 GBE, but it's still got 6 M2 NVMe bays, and that knocks around for about 499 nicker. That is absolutely insane. In today's video, we're going to put this thing through its paces a little bit. We're going to talk about the hardware, talk about the software, we talk about the brand itself and ultimately help you decide whether this fantastically affordable flash system probably the most affordable flash system i've ever seen is worth you and your data That is right, today we want to talk about this. From Asus Door, the FS6712X, also known as the Flash Door 12 Pro. No, we're not doing that joke again. We've already done that in the Before You Buy. That's right, we've already done a video on this very system and the six bay already. It was a Before You Buy, a short form review before we get to really dig into the system. So if you're looking for a much shorter review, because you must have looked along the time bar by now and gone, how long? Well, we did do a much shorter version of this where we went through the five things we liked and the five things we weren't sure about in that video. It should be linked to the description, but this is a much deeper review than that. In this video, we're going to go through it all. But before we go any further, why is this such a big deal? Why am I going on all like that about it? Well, it's because when it comes to most users, be they home, be they prosumer, be they business, the minute you hear the word flash server, which predominantly means a server like any other NAS, but utilizes uh, specifically SSD uh, storage media, the word flash stories immediately adds zeros to the price tag normally. If you look at most even relatively affordable flash server solutions in the market, the bulk of them start off in the thousands. They definitely arrive with four figures attached. And that's why in um, early 2023, when Acerdor first revealed that they were gonna be utilizing M2 NVMe targeted flash solutions in their lineup in a six and a 12 bay, and it started at 499 for the six bay and 850 for the 12 bay, that was very that was a huge deal in a storage market because notwithstanding the fact that it completely smashed what the actual understanding of what flash servers cost on top of that this device now challenges the price tag of the bulk of hard drive related now solutions to put that into perspective if you look at say QNAP solutions that we've got around here dotted around, the majority of those run on a not dissimilar CPU combination and memory combination of this device. Further still, we can look at that. This is Acer Store's own six bay, the Lockstore Gen 2. It's got the same CPU as this, the same kind of memory upgradability, and although it doesn't have 10 GBE on board, it can have 10 G added, and it's got four M2 NVMe bays along with those main six bays. This cost as much as this, give or take about 50 nicker. This device here arriving with that scalability in terms of storage in 2023, but only supporting M2 NVMe, is genuinely game changing. But enough of that for a moment. Let's talk about what we get for our money. If we unbox it again, quite swish packaging, I would say. It's just all very rarely disappoint when it comes to the packaging of their solutions there. Um, we've got the device itself all bagged up right there. And again, I have already opened this for testing in previous videos. So again, normally it's presented ever so slightly better than I'm showing you right now. Um, inside with our accessories, got inside there, we've got an external cable here. And again, I'll double check the cat rating on that one. We are looking at 
That is right, we got ourselves a CAT6 cable, lovely stuff for 10 GBU. We've got our cable lock, we've got our instructions and first time information and the uh, information on the three years of inclusive warranty. Also inside our accessories box, we've got our external PSU, a 90 watt PSU. Again, it's not surprising at all that this is going to be an external PSU device given the scale and you know concerned about temperatures and stuff like that moving forward. We've got an external mains cable, but that's enough for the accessories, right? You came to this video to look at it. Let's have a quick look inside. Overall, the accessories pack is fairly standard there. And overall, I'd say the complemented package that this arrives with is fairly standard, particularly when you compare it against most domestic high hard drive and even prosumer NAS systems moving forward. But I think it's time we talked about the design of this a little bit. Now I've said this in a previous video already, but the design of this I genuinely like. I really, really like it, but there's no denying it. This looks so much like a PlayStation 4, it's unreal. This looks more like a PlayStation 4 than a PlayStation 4, but there's no denying that for 12 bays of storage, this is absolutely tiny. And although it is arguably bigger from a certain perspective than these other devices behind us, if you actually worked out the calculated volume and mass, this thing is really small and really light. But moreover, it's portable as hell. This currently has or it's not fully populated. I think there's like eight or 10 M2 NVMEs inside this. This weighs nothing. And if you were to include the weight of that uh, the PSU there, it still doesn't weigh that much. You're probably looking at somewhere around one to 1.1 kilos, give or take, which means taking this on the go and setting this up on site is gonna be very convenient, especially when you work out with the 10 GBE. More on that later. Now, the ventilation on the device, and again, this is a plastic chassis. You can kind of feel the creep of that plastic a little bit. For the price tag, that shouldn't come as a huge surprise. I would have liked to have seen some elements of metal, uh, if not for heat dissipation and anything else, but overall, the around the course of the design of the device, it looks quite swish. They've gone for the kind of brushed steel effect plastic on that side, a normal matte plastic that side. On the base, we have got an active fan there that's plugged within the system uh, via quite a unique USB connection that we'll talk about later on. And on top of that, there are active, oh sorry, uh, there are passive heat sinks, a huge one on the CPU, and uh, the six um, uh, M2 NVMEs on one side and six M2 NVMe bays there on the other side. Now, accessing those bays isn't hugely straightforward, but at the same time, this is not gonna be supporting hot swapping. So you are never really going to have the facility to just pop drives in and out with convenience. This isn't like utilizing a hard drive bay because you can't hot swap M2 NVMEs. You can, you know, E1S and those newer range of adaptive SSDs, but you can't with this. But with this kind of solution and the target audience it's aimed at with that price tag and the hardware architecture, you were probably never gonna be going down the road of hot swapping without a reboot involved anyway. Now, ventilation as mentioned, we've got a ventilation uh, pad there at the top you can just make out there um, again as we rotate it we've got a ventilation base there on the side on the back here there's a very small amount of ventilation but that's actually a covered fascia there and we've got the power button really odd location actually for the power button being there i'm sure there's a design reason for it and when it light when it's on there's a nice little red light when it's powered on but it's quite an odd place for that power button whether that is for you know discreet uh, nature so no one touches it accidentally but you can have a big red light coming off it i'm not sure but i'm not really going to critique it too much for that uh, the base of it is ever so slightly raised with that fan working there to draw air over the dissipation uh, the heat dissipating uh, heat sinks inside and of course directly over the ssds themselves probably the primary concern of airflow there correct the whole system again Bear in mind with the heat sink panel, uh, the heat sink over the CPU here, and I think the memory just underneath, you're still gonna have quite a lot of warm air moving through this device. So although um, Asus Dora, and I'll talk about this later on in the video, we've, uh, again, I've been talking to Asus Dora about heat dissipation on this device in a few specific ways, I would still highlight that this needs to be in a slightly more ventilated area because notwithstanding the SSDs, you're still gonna have warm air traveling through this device and you've got the vent panel directly behind that larger CPU heatsink there. So do not think you can just put this in a nice closeted area. I would still rec highly recommend some kind of open air environment this is going to be installed within, not just some closed isolated cupboard where it's not gonna get cooler air introduced into that ecosystem all the way through. Now, if we look at 
the chassis there and accessing those drives we talk about the design because i do think within this section design within my review it is worth talking more specifically about the design and the implementation of those m2 nvme bays inside you've got four screws here on the base these four screws cover i believe bays one through six i might have got that the wrong way around it slides out like so nice and easy and the fan itself is connected via a usb slide mechanic there which i think is actually quite innovative the way that's been introduced again that fan could be controlled with an adm or you can set it to automatic highly recommended and that introduces us to the first six bays as i mentioned i've not fully populated this and i've actually got three different raid groups for this review spread across in there each one of those uh, and again we'll talk about this more in the internal hardware section but each one of these are uh, limited by their performance down to three times one. Again, that will become clear later why. And as you can see there at the back, that is our heat sink there for our main CPU hint heat sink. It occupies quite a lot of space, but all of that warm air working through once again. We're not going to be as worried about internal heating, uh, internal temperature increases as we discussed before. More on that later. But still, nonetheless, as somewhere nice and open in terms of airflow is going to be pretty vital for at least the external air that this is going to be working through. Now the other side comes off quite simple by removing two screws here and again when it comes to design implementation of accessing those individual bays this isn't too bad again because of the lack of hot swap support on this but still nonetheless slides off like that. It is still a little clunky there. We've got another six bays of storage that I've installed. Remember when you get it it will be unpopulated but Overall, that's still quite a clean implementation of each of those. And I think if you were going to go down the custom road, or even the way it's implemented in other NAS systems, it's not quite as cleanly laid out as this one. So I'll certainly give them credit on the way that has been laid out. The other thing worth touching on, again, later on we'll talk about it, is that little component down there. But for now, we've talked about the design. Let's talk about those ports and connections a little bit, shall we? Now the port and connectivity on this device, given its price tag, I would argue are pretty darn good. It's not perfect and there's a couple of critiques I've got for it, but for the most part, I'm really impressed with what I see here. Now to bring that closer, as you can see there along the bottom of the device, there's actually quite a lot of spacing there and there's a couple of things that I'm surprised aren't present. Now let's get straight into the, you know, the lead, uh, the lead of the show. This has got 10 gig there on the rear. It's a copper base port, 10 G base T, and that means you're looking at 1,000, 1,024 megabytes per second of external performance. Now, on the one hand, 10 GBE, 12 bay NAS, yum, yum, 850 nickel, where's the checkout? But there's only one port. Now, <coughs> I'm not going to be foolish enough to argue that this should be able to let me realize 12 bays of M2 NVMe external throughput, notwithstanding the price tag and the hardware architecture of this was never really going to allow me to realize, uh, you know, the full spec of those SSDs. I'm also not going to give this too much hassle for just being a single 10G given its price tag. My critique really is there's only one. Most 10G systems that I see arrive with 10G but also at least one 1 gigabit Ethernet port there, sometimes 2.5G, maybe a couple of ones, and the 10. Now, the reason being for that is because a lot of users want to dedicate that 10G to something more proactive. Maybe they're running um, direct 10GBE adapters, maybe Thunderbolt 10G adapters, maybe their system has a 10GB port already inside their system. Maybe they want to edit directly on the device or run you know, pretty comprehensive editing machines over 10GBE with this system or other 10G NASes. But what they don't want to do is utilize some of that 10G port to less prioritous connections within the local area network. So other devices that might be connected via another networking switch, uh, uh, other devices that you know provide in, you know incoming internet or an internet or another um, uh, uh, virtual LAN or VLAN that it's connected into, and only having one network port is weirdly limiting. Just from a topographical sense, not so much in terms of bandwidth. And the idea that that 10G is where everything's coming in and out, it's gonna start you know, kind of partitioning when things get busy. So I'm kind of disappointed that there's only one port. When you look at the Flash Store 6 that doesn't have 10G, but it's got 2.5G, it's got a couple of them on there. So realistically, this is gonna be a bandwidth limitation, isn't it? Because I've never seen a system that's had to spread its available PCI uh, lanes, the eight that the CPU supports, so thinly. I mean, it achieves it, but there's no denying that it is spread super thin. So 
I'm sure there are lots of reasons why there's only one port on there, and that makes sense within the architecture and the price tag. But there's just be aware that all of your in and out of this device is going via that single channel there. And yes, you can assign priority of service. Yes, running into a 10G switch allows you to use a managed switch to kind of divvy up that network connection. But just be aware, only the one network connection. Now, and when it comes to USB, the device has two USB ports. We've got a USB there and a USB there. Both of them 10 gig USB ports. So USB 3.2 Gen 2. That means each of them not only can you utilize lovely super fast 10G USB drives. I've got M2 NVMEs inside, so a thousand meg backup drives. But on top of that, you can use certain network adapters. Where's the local network adapter? USB network adapters. Now the range of supported adapters for first and third party is not you know comprehensive because obviously certification and verification processes are slow but i do know you can at the very least use 2.5g adapters on this but that does mean you can can theoretically add more network adapters if you need them but then you are going to start losing usbs on this which can also be used for supported kvm devices keyboard video mouse and controllers and bluetooth dongles and uh, dpt um uh, tv antennas there ups's office appliances as well you can use all of those but then you've got those two usbs doing a lot of the workload there. Now, to be fair, there are a couple of USB 2 ports there. There's a couple of USB 2 ports there, and these allow you to use less prioritous uh, USB devices. So if you're gonna be using a UPS for a heartbeat, you can use one of those. You're not gonna need 10 gig USB for that. Same goes for office peripheral devices like printers and scanners. Same goes if you're gonna be utilizing keyboard and, uh, and mice in conjunction with the visual output on this. But that still means you've only got two of those high priority USBs, which is fairly standard. It has to be said for the hardware architecture of this device and its um, price point there. So do pick and choose what you're gonna use those for quite carefully overall. Using one of them for a nice high speed backup and another one for a network upgrade makes a lot of sense. But it's also worth highlighting with the USB support, it's broader than any other brand out there in terms of the USB compatibility list. With a lot of brands starting to clip down the old range of USB devices being supported for security, Acer Store still maintains a much broader USB compatibility and support. Now, for those that heard the word security and are slightly worried that's a bad thing, I'm fundamentally disagree in a number of ways, largely because for a lot of threat actors to take advantage of the USB to inject any kind of hacking implementation into the device and take advantage of it, they'd have to be on site. And at that point, the threat actor has such an insane amount of capability and opportunity that the discussion around USB security is 50-50. There's arguments to and fro on that. Now, another thing you can do with that is take advantage of many of Acer Store's expansion devices. There is an 8-bay expansion, I believe, but more importantly, and more recently showed at Computex, they have a 4-bay expansion device um, that take, I think it's the AS5004U, if I've got that model ID wrong, I'm sure someone will tell me in the comments, but that 4 by expansion device is USB 3.2 Gen 2. So again, you can really take advantage, it is a JBOD, but fully take advantage of that 1000 megs directly from an expansion chassis into this. They currently, from what I understand, don't have any kind of flash expansions, and I'm not sure who would use that, but still nonetheless, it's nice to have a good range of expansion options open to you. Finally, when it comes to multimedia, not only does it have HDMI um, 2.0B, um, again, 4K 60 frames per second, and I would argue better bandwidth management uh, for visual data into this than other versions of HDMI, but there's also the SPDIV port, port there for audio and audio files that really, really want to keep a substantial high quality multimedia selection of audio that can also, also be interfaced with existing premium audio um, playback devices. And again, direct output there with control and indeed third party control of some of the applications on there to enjoy your audio on this. And all of that combined which is a better KVM output than a lot of devices out there and support for multimedia, makes this very, very attractive. Now the hardware inside, it's not groundbreaking, and more on that in a moment, but still, for most you know, uh, modest users, or any even people that take multimedia seriously, but not at a high-end professional output editing level, this is more than enough right now for you to enjoy your photo, video, and music files. And for those of you that want to take advantage of that 10GBE, thanks to a bunch of M2 NVMe storage space inside this, 
there's good options there, although again, we'll get onto the internal hardware in a moment, but overall, I quite like what we're seeing here on this device. And again, once you realize this is arriving at a not dissimilar price tag to a lot of those solutions next to me, which have got fewer bays and are hard drive only with the odd M2 inside for caching for the most part, a little bit of storage pool. This is still a huge amount of external connectivity to take advantage of in this architecture. But let's crack on with that internal architecture, right? Because it can't all be great, right? That is right, we're getting on to the part of the video I would like to title, that's the catch. Because I think most users who have looked at this and its price point, and particularly those users that I referenced at the beginning of the video with regard to what the word flash storage means to most users, this part of the video is where you're gonna feel a little bit more validated. And that is that this system running on an Intel N5105 quad-core Celeron processor inside with the CPU underneath there, this has got that quad core 2.0 gigahertz CPU that can be burst up to 2.9. That's four core, four thread. It's got integrated graphics. I think it peaks at uh, 750 or 800 megahertz. Um, and this also arrives with four gig of DDR4 memory that can be upgraded up to 16 gig across two slots there. The memory inside that it arrives with is a Pacer um, memory and it is 3200 four gig sodium. They're non-ECC. So what does all that mean? Well, that CPU is home plus. It's early SMB. The majority of people that take flash storage incredibly seriously wouldn't give that CPU the time of day. But these are also users that either have the capability or are ordering behalf of others with a budget in the thousands. You could not get a Xeon for that price tag inside this. You certainly couldn't have the scale of this device with a Xeon, given the, uh, ne um, the necessary heat dissipation factors that CPU would bring into the fold. Now, that CPU is gonna be good for Plex. It's gonna be good for all of the Acer Store ADM applications that we'll talk about later on in this video. It's very good for general uh, 10 GBE access. It's not quite gonna have the file um, server oomph of a Xeon, or even some of those embedded Ryzons which trade off against graphical manipulation in favor of just fast transmission and sustained performance, but it's still a very good CPU for general NAS use. And there's a reason why the majority of NAS brands, Asus thought included, have opted for that CPU in the last 18 months or so. However, because that CPU's only got eight lanes to play with, as mentioned earlier on, all of these bays are three times one. Even then, it's insane that they managed to get 12 bays of three times one SSD inside this. And a lot of it is thanks to a PCI bridge that's been introduced there, which, although it enables those extra bays, once again goes down the road into whittling down the maximum performance this is going to be able to achieve. Now, we've already discussed external performance and how having a single 10G there means you know, in the right setup with the right drives, particularly you're going to have to go maybe one TB at least per drive. Maxing out that 10G is going to be an absolute piss, uh, piece of piss. But when it comes to internal performance, you're not really going to have that external bottleneck, right? What's the performance numbers you're going to be hitting? Well, although our own benchmarking video is still in progress, and I will do some preview of that later in this video, it's worth highlighting that it will be very surprising if you can exceed two, maybe two and a half thousand megs not impossible if you gear it right with the right drives in the right environment but don't think that just because each of these bays are three times one cranking out a thousand megs each and 12 of them instantly means you're going to be getting 12,000 megs that is not the case it's just simply not possible in this device so you've got to remain relative now on the subject of m2 nvmes because these are gen 3 but they're going to be gen 3 times one the usual culprits that you would buy online for M2 NVMEs, and when it comes to NAS, you've got WD's SN700, WD Red series, or Seagate's Ironwolf series of NAS-based SSDs if you go down that road. These SSDs, being Gen 3 or Gen 4 in some cases, they have the potential to go to three, four, even 5,000 megs, depending on the drive you go for. And none of that is going to be possible here, notwithstanding because it's Gen 3 versus Gen 4 or whatever. But on top of that, the you're gonna be buying SSDs where you're never gonna get that performance threshold. And if that is a deal breaker for you, if the reason you were gonna go for a flash server is because you heard performance numbers in the thousands, if not tens of thousands, 
This might not be the device for you, and it's the reason this is so affordable, but it's also the reason why those other systems that you know have maintained the reputation of Flash up to this point are so, so expensive. But what Acer Store have done here is allow users to be able to take advantage of decreasing costs of M2 NVMEs in the market right now, and give you a means to further improve upon the potential of hard drive speeds but unfortunately, you'll never fully realize the performance benefits of 12 NVMEs. Now, there are ways, there are ways and means to still bridge closer to that. As you can see across these 12 bays, and I mentioned earlier on, I've not fully populated it. This system's running three different storage pools inside here. We've got ourselves uh, a couple of RAID 1s and a RAID 5. The RAID 1 being the System OS one that I targeted, and the other two running for just general shares for the performance benchmarks. And we've got other drives being tested too for that video coming up soon with Ed. Um, but when you use those multiple pools, that does allow you to create smaller pockets of higher performing um, uh, uh, areas of storage pool each of which can capitalize on their own kind of parallel running pools. On top of that, remember, you don't have to fully populate this on day one. And I think that is a real deal breaker for a lot of users who have been looking at these systems. Because one thing this brings to the party, which I don't think gets anywhere near enough credit in other reviews I've seen online, is if you only have a finite budget to spend on your own private NAS solution, you've already decided it's going to be for Plex or whatever, maybe you've got grand to play with. And whether you go for the 6 or 12 bay of this, you can go ahead and only put one or two NVMEs in this. And then gradually, over time, add more drives. As the price of M2 NVMEs continues to drop and you can scale up that storage so you can keep this within your budget on day one when had you gone for a hard drive NAS yes you had the potential for more storage capabilities but spending a grand on a four bay you're going to lose half of that immediately on the NAS and you can scale up and get those extra bigger hard drives but this with 12 bays gives you a huge scope for expandability as the price of SSDs drop, combined with the fact that right now we're even starting to see M2 NVMEs rocking out at 8TB, and those are TLC NAND ones. If you go down the road of QLC NAND SSDs, which although drop in performance, not so much of a problem here because you've already got that CPU and the limitations in place, you have the potential to go insane with your capability and the price per terabyte of those M2s once you break into QLC NAND, where durability, unless you've got a high frequent daily refresh rate of your data, isn't really gonna be anything to worry about as efficiency and development in QLC NAND has improved. Overall, I can't really give this too much sugar for its um, handling of the PCIe lanes on this. And to keep within that price point and arriving with Celeron, bravo overall. But for now, let's get the lid back on this, get it booted up again, and start talking about the software and capabilities of this system to you. So, to really dig deep into the software you get included with the Flash Talk, because remember, it is a full first-party NAS OS you get rolled in with this device, despite its modest price tag there, it would be longer than this video. Indeed, I've already covered it in other videos. I've done a full dedicated video on the surveillance software, and although we're going to touch on the surveillance later in this, I will highlight that this video here, linked in the description, goes through a lot of stuff from the mobile applications all the way down to the desktop tools you're going to use, and indeed, we've done two full reviews of ADM version 4 on two different NAS systems in the last 18 months. So although I'm going to do another dedicated video for the software on the flash door, which is just ever so slightly here off camera, it's worth highlighting that I'm going to have to skim over things a little bit in this video when going through it, but I will touch on a lot of these details throughout the video. And also, as I alluded to earlier on, benchmarking for this device is still ongoing. And right now, Eddie, as you can see from a recording here from earlier in the week, is still conducting a lot of benchmarking on this device along with temperature sensing stuff. Uh, and this is going to be going with a multiple uh, multiple different RAID arrays across both the Flash Station 6 and the Flash Station 12 Pro, going with different combinations of hard drives, diff oh, sorry, um, SSDs, different combinations of brands and different RAID profiles there. And the problem is that is taking substantially longer Longer to allocate the SSDs um, from different brands as well as utilizing and creating those raid pools every single time. But I will say that at the moment, 
um, the hardware um, configuration that we're seeing here in front of us is just more and more showing us that that uh, kind of modest CPU we're seeing inside this device is resulting in performance, as you can see here on the left-hand side, even early provisional RAID 5 testing with some very low-end OWC SSDs. We're still hitting around 1,676 megabytes per second sequential read, and we did get that as high, I should say, as about 1850 but I think we'd have to go for more bulkier SSDs and really fully populate the array to get higher than that. And once we got down to the 4K randoms, that's when we saw 3,000, oh, sorry, 333,000 um, 4K random IOPS in read. But write is where it really suffered. Because in the terms of write, not only because of that 3 times one lane allocation, uh, whether you're going to go through that um, uh, PCI bridge there, but on top of that, just simply that CPU, um, even if we had bulked up the RAM to maybe 8 or 16 gig, we were still not really seeing the performance numbers um, going high. We were we were barely breaking into the 1000s until we started looking at larger RAID configurations. But as I say, what you're seeing on screen there was some testing in the background and some back and forth with different SSD combinations. And there's going to be a much more fuller video on that in temperatures coming up soon. We didn't want to hold up the review much longer, but it is in progress right now. But onto ADM. So ADM, I would say, is better than it has ever been. And although I've talked about Asus Store's um, NAS software several times here on the channel, I would say in this system, it's the best it's ever been. Notwithstanding the range of applications and services that are included both on the first and the third party, but they have removed a lot of that third party chaff in their app center that has been there year on year in the past. They've every year minimized it down. And although they definitely exist, something I'll show you later on, there's nowhere near as many as there used to be there. And also because of the hardware architecture of this device, not only does that mean you get access to the full array of applications and services that may not be included in like an ARM-based NAS like the uh, Drive Store series, where they have to remove some of the more comprehensive applications, but on top of that, because this is running on NVMe, the performance of those individual applications is substantially higher. Now, um, we've already created the login for this. Again, we've done setup videos for you to check out there. And I would say uh, a good line has been found between the first and third party applications there. Notwithstanding, as mentioned, the Asus Store apps, several of which have been installed and during the installation, you are invited to utilize their own kind of preset combos of apps if you're a multimedia user dedicated to backup business or all, you can go into all of those and have them all installed. And again, the full range of applications there that are available is pretty massive. Um, if we were to focus, for example, just on the installed applications, these are ones that I've installed with the presets and a few ones that I personally would utilize on this system. And again, I'm running a lot of apps here, something we need to bear in mind later when I talk about the temps and when I talk about this system being utilized in a broader and larger fashion there. So for example, going through here, these are all of our kind of multimedia performance and backup applications we've got readily available uh, via the Asus Store um, ADM uh, range of applications and services. So, so for example, you've got your inbuilt kind of uh, remote access backup uh, services there. And again, this is where a slightly more technical options that have been presented pretty darn well. And it is a nice snappy GUI that we're utilizing there. Next up, if we want to kind of ramp things up a little bit, we've got application tools and services for um, the synchronization, of course, if we want to synchronize between our local client device and the system. And again, that's when you've got your file pinning. That's when you're using your OS um, your own Windows or Mac OS uh, file manager to integrate interact with the NAS if you choose to. Then if we go to the next page, we do have uh, the Cloud Backup Center tool that allows you to create um, a remote backup to support with third-party cloud services there. And it's actually as the kind of the standard ones you would expect. And there's even some proprietary applications for some of those cloud providers in the app center rather than using this broad uh, one portal interface which arguably a lot of you would probably prefer now things like um container management and virtual machine utilization these are uh, the area where asus store being arguably a comparative uh, comparatively smaller platform than the likes of synology or qnap out there in the market are a little bit more reliant on third parties now you may like or dislike that but 
For example, they utilize the likes of uh, Docker and Portainer. If you choose to, and you're gonna need that to run a lot of those apps. Indeed, a lot of the third-party applications that run on this system are in of themselves containers with a glossy little GUI on the front. So a lot of the time you're gonna be using containers on this system and not even realizing you're doing it. And when it comes to virtual machine utilization, they do support VirtualBox. So if we go into the categories menu there and we want a little bit more, want to go into virtualization, um, we can go into there and you can see a lot of those first and third party ones and the look center of course to three click install uh, uh, an ubuntu uh, vm there and of course virtualbox ready to rock when you need it and again if you've used virtualbox you'll know that as when it comes to open source it's probably one of the best vm tools out there uh, to have an on nas hypervisor that isn't first party if you were going to go third party you might go a uh, virtual box perhaps proxmox but even then proxmox running within this system on a celeron man alive you're going to hit a wall pretty darn quickly there now when it comes to multimedia fair play to them although they don't have some of the real killer stuff of uh, Synology or QNAP, what they don't have, they do bridge quite well with those third, part, third party tools like Plex Media Server, um, like Jellyfin and MB, all of which can either officially or unofficially be installed on this uh, via supported APKs in the App Center there. But when it comes to multimedia, as I mentioned, Plex Media Server is available straight away. And if we were to do just a quick benchmark there, and I, before I do that, I do want to make a note of the system temps because that is going to be relevant later on because we've been running this system now for just shy of four weeks because we wanted to get extensive testing as i mentioned with ed and i want you to just take a quick look at that uh, system and cpu temp because we'll be coming back to that later on and i didn't want what we're about to do to skew the discussion later on there 56 over 69 for system and cpu temps there plex playback on this device again is going to come down a lot to that celeron process there thanks to it having integrated graphics it does mean that you are going to have a little bit of oomph when it comes to those conversions now to put that into perspective here is um, a 4k file right now and i'll open it up at the bottom there this is a 4k file with quite a substantial amount of uh, kind of quality to it dare i say it's 24 frames per second 1200 megabits per second but it is h.264 and we can skip forward and it will absolutely play back this file beautifully we can skip back and forward and we can go in and it's running great and that's because it's in the original quality there and as you can see while we're doing this we're using quarter of cpu we've got some memory utilization within chrome however what if we play back this file but this time we want to uh, enable some transcoding there so again we'll go into the file we'll move forward even though transcoding is becoming less relevant these days there are still users via remote access utilizing devices that maybe do not have sufficient or even enabled licenses for h.265 or on side or client side conversions if we go for a conversion there and we convert it down and we convert it say down to 1080p we've still got the file converting but we're definitely seeing a change there in how much of the buffering was available and we're seeing no pauses but if we go into the system resource utilization which you can do via the activity monitor here or utilizing one of the third party tools um, here we're able to see that utilization, although not bad, is still um, kind of biting just a little bit there in terms of uh, available buffering happening there in the background. But what if, if we go for something a little beefier? And again, you'll see more of this when we do our dedicated Plex transcoding. But if we look at the roast duck file, which is a pretty substantial H.265 file, and we try to play back this one, and again, bear in mind while we're doing that, that again, we're not fully utilizing my whole system settings, remember? And also if we look at my system config, we're running an i5 12 gen, um, you know, fairly substantial CPU and it's got GPU card in on board. Utilization, we're still not getting immediate playback. Yes, we're playing it in the web browser, which will always cap a little bit of that performance. But when it comes to conversions on this, although it supports it, I would still argue that that CPU is never given the chance um, or at least the ability to do more in terms of conversions. And we're seeing a slight pause then. Again, we'll go into more detail on that on our dedicated Plex vid. But for example, if we go into the native application for Plex Media Server here on the Windows system, we go in and we play back that same file. So again, 
there is the row stuck file there we'll go to 4k trailers we'll find the um the row stuck playback and again if we play it on a device that does have hevc support and therefore conversion wasn't necessary buffering just like that it's running like a dream so just bear in mind the system architecture we are talking about here does mean that some actions and this isn't really asus doors 4 although i would argue that they're not being as efficient with plex as we've seen from other brands who have got more out of that cpu to play back this file i would still argue that cpu is really the cause for plex transcoding at this scale of file not being quite as smooth as some might like but just bear in mind if you're not going to be using conversions and conversions you're not really going to be using transcoding this whole point is moot anyway and they'll play like a dream but moving before uh, moving forward from plex media server some of their own applications unfortunately aren't quite as polished um, and i do think if you're looking at this system then chances are you're going to be looking at those third party tools it's not that they're bad they're just not as feature to some of the other ones out there but again you've got to scale the size of asa store versus the size of some of the other brands out there and that wonga they've got to throw at it from the two audio applications one of which is incredibly analytical i might add in terms of the information you can garner from a lot of the files you're trying to play uh, the video application there although it does play back these files and there's two different dlna or upnp uh, playback apps out there um, it doesn't really have the same level of presentation and client app support that some of the other bigger brands have got or plex media server the photo tool doesn't really have ai photo recognition does have tag recognition although it supports different file formats including gif and live photo it's not quite as established as some of the other ones out there um, and again moving across all of those multimedia apps if you head into that app center there is a whole range of third-party applications out there for you to play with for multimedia just go through the categories and you'll see what i mean now talking about those applications and talking about multimedia and utilizing the hardware for you we got to talk about the asa store portal outlet now for again i mentioned it earlier in the video but the system has an hdmi output it has that special audio output as well but asa store portal is what allows the system to um, have its own parallel gui via the hdmi and you can utilize a keyboard video uh, keyboard and mouse you can use a usb uh, dongle equipped bluetooth remote there's even an application you can use on a mobile phone to control with that and with that hdmi output you do have a degree of control i would say and when you go through you can choose what the default applications are to use change all of these things from the nas side but the asus store portal is a completely separate gui you're not just mirroring what you're seeing here via the network or remotely over the internet which is good i would argue there because you don't really want that from the comfort of your sofa now going back to what i mentioned earlier on about applications and services that are included um, within the system between the first and the third party i would argue this is one of the areas where asus store could really clean things up a little bit because the range of apps uh, they've got available in the asus store portal area there's a lot of third party stuff in there that needs cleaning up look at this range of app like, like for example when you want to add on your third party tools uh, for media streaming so whether it is the disney plus your amazon prime instant your netflix and more now it is good i would argue that they've got these apps because if you are if you're running a system where you've only got one uh, your monitor has one particularly high-end hdmi out like some tvs have got one hdmi 2.1 and the rest are, uh, hdmi 2.0 or that ilk it's good that you're going to be able to utilize that high performance interface of your visual output but still have access to your prime your netflix your whatever but it's still a very messy lineup of apps they definitely cleaned it up they definitely have and there are more applications with hdmi out but some of them i think could require more updates or better management and i know they're third party but a lot of the emulation tools to run uh, consoles from within the user user interface and attach you know your you know your emulated controller of choice but still nonetheless the range of third-party applications does sometimes lead to a slight inconsistency of the services that are available to you you know enthusiasts home labbers might quite like that as well as the utilization of using a lot of those third-party container things there but the more novice user 
is going to get overwhelmed very, very quickly or just start installing things willy-nilly, leading to a very inconsistent experience overall. And of course, we've got to talk about the storage management itself, because if you're going to be owning your own flash system at this affordable level and the dropping prices of M2S NVMEs in the market, it's incredibly important that you're able to um, monitor and utilize your storage as best you can. And in the storage manager here, I would say it's one of the clearest UIs for this I've seen in a very long time. It's straight to the point of right there we i've already created three independent volumes on this system that are spread across different disk combos there now the uh, storage pool volume relationship is not quite the same as other brands when you're setting it up and you're creating new pools um i would argue it's a lot more streamlined and again whether you think that's a good or a bad thing is really down to you and your level of experience as an end user um but i will add that when you are creating individual storage pools Yes, we're using NVMEs, but still nonetheless, it does feel quicker. It does. And you've got the choice of EXT4 or, of course, BTRFS and the benefits that they present there. But as you can see, we've created for our performance benchmarks, or at least the first round of them before we start using other SSDs, um, we've created different pools of BTRFS, EXT4, and we've gone for different RAID combinations as well. And it's very easy to set those up and start creating your snapshots and your back-end backups with the other tools that I've shown you just now. Now, if we look at the individual SSDs, we can see the temps there because we should talk about the temps because it is something I talked about in my previous video when I did my should you buy before you buy video on this. And I did show concerns about the system and its temperature and particularly with reference to those SSDs, because I was concerned that Acer Store did not include M2 NVMe heat sinks on a six and 12 bay system, despite the fact they were um, kind of throttled or bottlenecked, if you will, to three times one because of the CPU architecture there. Now, massive credit to Acer Store, because they did, after my videos you can see here, hopefully YouTube doesn't get on my case about this, did do a follow-up video on their own channel highlighting my concerns there and addressing how they were putting the system with some raid scrubbing in their own temperature monitoring area and just ultimately showing that these ssds during raid scrubbing how they capped and remember as long as your ssd uh, doesn't go over about 70 um c you should be fine but Another part of my concern that I touched on, which is why we're doing another video in the background, and honestly, we do not have the full answer in time for this video at all, um, was to do with, and it's closed out there, um, just the general system temp. When I was talking about utilization uh, of cooling in this system, and we're gonna bring it up here, um, there is that base level fan underneath, but we have to bear in mind that we've got 12 bays of storage and a CPU fan inside this system, which has an enormous heat sink, but we're quite heavily reliant on active airflow on this system. And again, it's not a system that's feeling out of this world hot, but I think a number of people, myself included, were wondering about the general system temp of the device. Now, when we do our temp video, we're gonna be pulling the SSDs that have been inside this for weeks and using Crystal Disk to look at their temperature over that extended period to see how they all did. But it's also worth touching on the CPU temp as well. Because when we look at the system information during that time, we're able to see that the CPU temp is at 71 here. Now, if we ignore the system temp just a tiny bit, we won't, but it's still a little bit high I would argue, for a system temp, it's not bad high. It is definitely not bad. 56 is fine, but it's at the slightly higher ebb of fine. And when I've talked about um, other systems, say this QNAP here that we've had on for quite a while, and here we can see the CPU temp at 46, I'm uh, sorry, the system temp at 36 and the CPU temp at 46, we can see that again, the CPU temp there is markedly higher that was why i showed you the temp earlier on before we did our plex test i wanted you to know that this system has been running in the background of a lot of videos in the last three weeks you've probably seen it about there in the background running and during that time we've seen that cpu temp live between 60 oh, sorry, i'd say about 55 and 70 consistently which i know seems like a large margin there and again I have to, you know, we have to articulate that that is not a game over temperature. Indeed, if we go for this article here, this has been a consistent kind of observation. Celeron's 
are fine up to about 85. So it's still well within the remit of that temp for it to be absolutely fine running at that CPU temp there. But I will say it when it did spike, it spiked quick. And a lot of users like to have their CPUs closer to the 50 or 60 mark there. So this is not a bashing critique of that system temp there. But I will say that on average, the system does run a higher temp than most other NASes. And definitely, I would argue, slightly higher than other flash-based systems I've reviewed. Definitely not in any kind of danger zone, but if you are an absolute stickler for temps, just be aware this will run a little hotter than some of the other devices out there. And finally, when it comes to client applications, again, for mobiles and desktop, as I mentioned earlier on, there's actually quite a few available. If you head over to their own site, they've got downloads there for the most recent version of ADM. But on top of that, you've got some of those client applications for desktop. I will say that it's much more skewed towards Windows at the moment than it is Mac. I know Mac is a little trickier to develop for and get licensing for in some cases, but if you go into the app area, you can download pretty much everything straight off the bat there. Some services on the Flash Store, I would argue, definitely run better when you're using the client app. Case in point, the most common example, and it's one that I touched on in my uh, surveillance video when we were looking at the desktop client and the mobile client for their surveillance applications, well, when it comes to their desktop surveillance tool, and again, we've got that there running. Let's get my hand in shot. They do tend to run a little better with the desktop applications overall, but still, I think a lot of users would quite like to see kind of improvements on a lot of those apps because some of the design is just ever so slightly dated in cases. And again, I know there's an extension to what a brand can spend on upgrading and kind of flourish with a lot of their apps and services there. But there is definitely a feel on a lot of the design of the applications that they could serve to be just a little bit more modern than they are. But let's wrap things up. When it comes to the 10 GBE performance of the Flash Station 12 Pro, again, it's going to be very hard to give you a realistic interpretation of it because of the drives that we're utilizing for this section of the review, because we were doing lots of benchmarks there in the background. And as you can see, all of these drives that we're utilizing are much, much smaller OWC drives for the most part. And although we've got a couple of mid-sized drives, and the bulk of which within the RAID configurations, we've gone for a combination of smaller drives, which was the only ones we could secure for the review at this stage. So at the moment, what I've done is gone ahead with this device and I'm utilizing a Thunderbolt to 10G adapter that is directly connected to the single 10G interface here of the Acer store, as you can see there, as I desperately try not to disconnect it. Hence why you can hear that background hum while we're doing this. Now, again, that's the solo 10G connection there. We've gone in and reallocated our connection to the device within the Acer store configuration. There's our new 196, uh, 169 IP. And on top of that, moving forward, if we go into the network settings of the device, we go into the network. As you can see, not only are we utilizing that 10G at full 10G bandwidth all along, but on top of that, we've set the MTU to 9000. Same goes for the network adapter here on the local side of things. But because we've got the different RAID configurations there on these drives, we're not really going to fully realize the 12 bay performance potential of this device. But needless to say, even if you did fully populate this device, You've only got one 10G connection, up to 1,000, maybe 1,024 megs uh, of transmission to play with there. So even then, you're never really going to be able to fully realize externally the performance potential of this device, perhaps utilizing USB to network adapters there. But again, I will say the performance numbers you're going to see are very weak compared to what they could be because of the drives we're utilizing. Case in point, if we go for the RAID 1 configuration there, so that's the two drives of the RAID 1 configuration, and these are just two 250 gig Gen 3 SSDs that have been capped down to three times one. And again, we're not using any kind of background caching there. We're gonna go for continuous running. We're not using any localized cache, just read write test there on a 256 meg file. And if we run that test, again, we're getting only 600 over 700 or so there. Let's go for a run continuous there while we're rabbiting so although that performance number doesn't seem great for this flash door one you've got to bear in mind the drives that we are utilizing for this stage and again we're going to do better ones better drives for the full benchmarking but on top of that you've also got to factor in this is a celeron based system this is a system that's going to be running on a quad core celeron with that four gig and you already start to see some of that throttle in there while we're oversaturating those drives in this testing there and while it's doing that again I will touch on, again, when it comes to the temperature of this device running in the background, we're going to start seeing those rises. But 
I would argue not as high as they could have been given we just did sustained activity with just two of those drives there. So although those numbers are high, they're still well within the parameters of healthy and if anything, they're not quite as high as I thought they'd be for just 45 seconds of benchmarking. Now, if we move over to the RAID 5 test there, so this is the RAID 5 and that RAID 5, if we go into the storage manager there, as I mentioned at the beginning of this, I'm impressed the combination of ADM, that Celeron and these NVMEs for how snappy this OS is being. Um, if we look at the RAID 5 configuration there, and you can see that RAID 5 configuration there is made up of five of these lower capacity, low performing SSDs there, and it is running on an EXT4 configuration. So if we switch over to that for our RAID 5 test, same thing, and we scan that through, again, relatively modest numbers overall but unfortunately because of those drives we can't really overtly test that and as mentioned at the beginning of this software side ed's doing more comprehensive and detailed breakdowns that we'll put on the channel later with different ssd combinations different rate combinations and all of that hopefully with the temp testing in that video and more not breathtaking numbers it has to be said and these are large blocky data as well so if even if we scale that up to maybe a one gig file to get a truer representation of sequential read write these numbers are still not going to blow you know five ten grand flash servers apart but the point is it was never supposed to this is supposed to be an entry level flash system as the cost of m2 nvmes come down and users want to be able to see is their viability and getting a NAS and ditching slower hard drives and opting instead for faster and now slightly more affordable M2 NVMEs. But let's head back into the studio and summarize today's review. So what do we think? Well, the design I really, really like. I would have liked to have seen metal. I would have liked to feel maybe something to feel a little bit more robust. But at the same time, for the price tag of this 12 bar, around 850, and again, that's six bay for a 499, this is insanely good value. And I think the construction, it's easy on the eye. I think it has got a good amount of ventilation there. And although we're still on, you know, we're still on the fence and the jury's still out for us here on the channel about long-term temperatures on this device, there's a huge and compelling argument from both Acer Store and just our general use for almost four weeks that the temperature on this is not gonna go into anywhere dodge. Indeed, when it comes to noise on this device, we had this in the background for ages running for other videos and none of you heard it running in the background, which shows that this is definitely low noise. We didn't have to remove it from the audio view with the mic or anything. And if you're someone that's looking forward to taking advantage of the HDMI out or that specialized um, SP div uh, there on the rear for the audio, you're someone that's gonna want something powerful, quiet, and fast to enjoy your video, enjoy your raw, intense audio flack files. And this is gonna be very appealing to you. This arriving at that price tag again, that price tag again about 850, 860, with 10 GBE on board for 12 bays of NVMe storage, come on, that's insane. Whether you're looking at the six or 12 bay, there's never been that kind of value, even in hard drives. If you saw a 12 bay hard drive NAS with 10 GBE, do you think that will be rocking an 860 price tag outside of DIY? It definitely wouldn't. Trust me, I'd know. Um, ADM is better than it's ever been, and although it doesn't challenge, I think, completely the likes of Synology, DSM, QNAP, QTS, or TrueNAS, I think it does make a very good compelling argument for itself in terms of inclusion in this package as a genuinely nice feeling NAS software that it includes. And although it's a little bit more reliant on third party apps uh, than developing their own, I think the core structure and fra framework and foundation of ADM is still pretty darn solid with everything from cloud synchronization and multi-tiered backups to multimedia application support of BTRFS and a robust uh, networked backend to play with there. Finally, again, moving beyond that price tag, the cost of M2 NVMEs has dropped to a point now, be the QLC NAND or TLC NAND, that makes getting this and partially populating it and gradually upgrading over time a great deal more palatable. And RAID expansions are a thing that are supported on this device, although things like hot swapping are not. Now, not it's not gonna be for everyone. I think most of you that think this is some quick fix, get out of jail free card, I own a flash NAS, I want super performance, 
have to keep things relative. There's a reason for that price tag and that CPU is a big part of it. This ain't no Intel Core or Xeon. You've got eight lanes to play with and this thing is squeezing the living heck out of those, particularly with those Gen 3 times one slots for those drives and six of those running through that bridge there. Now, the single port, Oh, there on the rear, that 10G. It's good that it's 10G. I don't like that it's only one port, but I'm sure there's lots of reasons for that. And on top of that, we have to at least acknowledge that Asus Store were one of the brands that were impacted by the Deadbolt ransomware group. I reckon they handled it better than a lot of brands out there with their end user base, but there's also the counter argument that they don't have the sheer number of units in the wild as other brands. So even then, we, sh we have to at least discuss that they did, they were impacted by Deadbolt like a few other brands. They weren't the only people that were targeted by the Deadbolt ransomware group. And they took their lumps and they've integrated a lot of increased security defaults within this system. And do not allow system users to just brush past a lot of that security without full understanding of the choices they are making in a number of cases. Right the way down to the initial... Um, uh, uh, initialization of the device where it prompts you and goes right we recommend you change these ports if you're not going to change them that's on you and that for a lot of users and those default ports was the first step towards getting hit by ransomware having default ports but overall I really like this device I think it's if not the most exciting NAS that Asus Store have released in their entire history, in my opinion, it's probably one of the best NASs. It's potentially one of the best NASs of the year for me. But I'm going to hold off full judgment until we do our full benchmarking and temperature testing on this. But apart from that, I hope you've enjoyed this video. If you have, let me know in the comments. As mentioned, there is a shorter form review uh, link below where we, I think that was about three weeks ago that went out, and I recommend you check that out. If you want to learn more, we've done a full review with lots of close-up photography and we'll be issuing the benchmarks as they happen in that article below if you want to learn more there's links towards more Acer store reference stuff and some of the other videos and previous stuff that we've done with regards to the software the surveillance and more that you can check out soon we're going to be doing another dedicated video on flash service that i recommend you check out and on top of that if you're on the fence about buying a NAS solution you're still not aware where your money can get you these days or what's the best solution for your needs use the free advice section the big blue button on the right hand side of nas compares or use our free community forum ask nas compares for answers to your questions or you can use our discord to get answers from other members of the community and me and eddie i'll be honest more eddie than me if i'm honest i'm busy doing this um on top of that if this video has helped you decide on a product that you were going to buy and you're going to shop at amazon scan b &H, Newegg, any of those websites. If those two things are true, then please use the links in the description to take you to those stores. Notwithstanding, it's not going to cost you anything to click that. And they don't harvest your information. But when you use those links, anything you buy, and I mean anything you buy, results in a kickback to me and Eddie here at NASCAMBIS. It's just the two of us doing two, now close to three articles a day and a video every day. So that allows you to passively support other content creators. It's just us here and we love doing what we do and that really helps us. But apart from that, this has been the review of The Flash Store and I'll see you on the next video.